So I'm going to kick off with this introductory talk. Uh, it's, it's quite a bit of material. Um, after me, we'll have Brad talk in detail about the actual certification process. I think that's important for us to understand, and it's one of the key things that I think we can, we can provide uh, and point people to who are, who are looking at organic. Um, after that, Tony will give a brief talk about conservation planning with organic and transitioning farmers. And then after that will be kind of a discussion back and forth um, talk, talking through some different aspects of the National Organic Program regulations, the NOP standard, and then how we can connect that to conservation uh, practices, okay? Uh, then we'll have, that'll be about the time that we have lunch. And then following lunch, we'll have a panel discussion uh, with several of the folks who are here with us today. And then immediately after the panel, we'll head, head north up to Andy Ambriel's farm for a discussion with him, look at some of his equipment, and then we'll probably uh, go check out a couple of fields. So any questions about the agenda for today? All right, very good. Okay, so first I kind of want to let you guys know what I'm up to in this new role. I started into this role officially exactly two years ago, September of uh, 2016, but didn't really fully transition into the role until uh, the following January as I sort of untangled myself from everything in Delaware County. So I just want to let you know some of the things I'm up to, where I'm focused, uh, and where you might be interested in plugging in and, and getting involved. So spending a lot of my time getting calls from farmers who are looking at transition, want to understand the process, some of that basic upfront information. Um, very simple website. There's not a lot of resources there yet, but it's been a way for people to find me. Okay, if they Google Indiana Organic, Purdue Organic, Extension Indiana Organic, whatever, any of those combinations, they can find this website and then find me. So they at least have someone they can email and call uh, to be sort of a, you know, a resource just to answer basic questions and start connecting them in the organic space. Uh, a grant that we were awarded uh, last year from SARE, Sustainable Ag Research and Education, I hope, is, is everyone f familiar with SARE, USDA program? I hope so. That's what's funding this training today. Okay, our, our state professional development funds from SARE are funding this today. I've got information in the back uh, with different SARE materials. But anyway, it's a research and education grant. Um, myself, Tamara Benjamin, uh, a team at IU led by Dr. James uh, Farmer, and then Dr. Ariana Torres, who's in our Ag Econ department, are involved with this project. But it's all about uh, organic grain transition, so grain farmers transitioning ground uh, into organic. What are the barriers? What are the opportunities? How can we better support those farmers who are transitioning ground um, here in Indiana? So some pieces of that, we did an extensive survey, had nearly 500 farmers, uh, conventional, organic, transitioning, respond to that survey, and we're, the, the team at IU is currently working through that. Um, making sense of the data. Ariana and, and a grad student are currently conducting interviews, in-depth interviews with buyers of organic grain so that we can get better information about organic markets because that, that's one of the challenges is as you get into organic production, it's not just hauling it to you know the, the elevator or the closest ethanol plant. Um, finding buyers, understanding pricing, uh, differences in contracting. Uh, we want to get all that information and, and be able to provide that to farmers. I have recruited a handful of farmers uh, who will let me pester them for the next two years who are currently transitioning ground into organic, uh, basically conducting in-depth case studies so we can learn from their experiences. Okay. And then also uh, with, with all that information developing uh, traditional outreach and extension opportunities. So workshops, field days, um, regional farmer meetings, things like that. So started into that this year, we had a very successful field day in 
White County at Jason Fetter's farm had over 170 people in attendance, actually from eight states. So it's clear that there's demand for this information. Okay, this was very much targeted at uh, conventional grain farmers who are looking at the opportunity or may already have ground in transition. We focused on equipment uh, around tillage, cultivation, weed management. Okay, I had a huge lineup, but great field day, just had panel discussions with farmers and looked at equipment. Um, so looking to do more of this. If this is the kind of thing you'd like to do in your county, give me a call, I'll work with you on it, okay? Another project, uh, it's some internal funding, the Purdue Ag Seed Program. It's essentially a few more pieces to keep building out this organic grain extension program effort, okay? So there's three pieces to it. One of them is uh, that I see as a huge challenge in Indiana, at least when we look at, look at it across the whole state, is that we do not have a sort of grassroots organic farmer association. A lot of our neighboring states have had NGOs like this in place for, for years, for decades, and it's an easy way for people to plug in to the organic community in their state. Uh, and we don't have that here. Uh, and I think it's, it also allows the organic community in those states to have a more unified voice when it comes to things like approaching elected officials and the state house about things to support the organic ag community. Okay, so I want to try to identify some key leadership in our state and build an advisory committee. Uh, obviously, first and foremost would be the priority of, of directing Purdue's efforts in the organic realm, but I want it to be uh, you know, an advisory committee that informs all of us, all of our agencies, um, and then hopefully start to build that into a conversation about developing uh, an Indiana organic association of some kind. Okay. Uh, and with that, I want that advisory committee to work with me to plan kind of a, a summit. I don't like the word summit anymore after North Korean summit and then Helsinki summit. It's not the right word, um, but basically to bring a broader range of stakeholders and leaders in the organic sector in Indiana together, and sort of have this broaden this conversation about where we're headed as a state and how we can better support organics here. Uh, second one, working with uh, Michael Langemeyer in the Ag Econ Department, we hired a grad student who's working on developing crop budgets uh, on organic field crops and transitional crops. Uh, so we'll look at, build that, it'll be spreadsheet tools that people can use, but then build some different scenarios uh, based on some of the rotations and the strategies that different farmers are using. Okay. And then finally, we've got uh, 26 acres in transition at one of our research stations, actually the one closest to here, the Northeast Pack. Um, so we're just taking it through transition with cover cropping, keeping it simple, uh, with the idea of being able to do demonstration and research of organic row crops. Because right now in the Purdue system, we have only about 11 acres certified, and they're devoted to some specialty crop research projects and our hemp research um, that uh, is at the MIGS farm in, in Lafayette. So this will, will give us an opportunity to finally um, see if we can manage some organic row crops and then start to build some actual research pro projects off of it. Uh, so, so with all these things over time, wanting to build you know, a, a robust farmer-driven extension program. Okay, I want it to, to be practical, you know, traditional programs, resources. Uh, and I think a key thing is this item right here is the network development and just facilitating connections because we don't have any other entity in our state that's doing that broadly. Okay, we have clusters in the state that have developed organic industries and people you know, can connect and plug in easily, but I think across the state, that's a huge thing that's lacking. Okay. So if you wanna be a part of that, please, please reach out to me, okay? Make some things happen in your counties. I'm happy to work with you. One thing that you might be interested in if you wanna jump into this more, uh, we have some additional SARE professional development funds to take a bit of an immersive learning field trip. It'd probably be a week long commitment, similar to this Rodale trip, but rather than going to Rodale and just parking at Rodale for a week, uh, 
we'll kind of cruise around probably Illinois, Wisconsin, maybe Iowa, visit some farms, visit some other extension folks, uh, maybe some, uh, some people affiliated with organic associations in other states and just learn from them and bring some of that knowledge back to our state. So if that's something you're interested in, uh, I'm gonna start planning that this winter uh, with the idea that we'd probably do this uh, late summer of 2019. And one more commercial. Um, I'm also uh, still very heavily involved with the annual Indiana Small Farm Conference. I chaired it for the last four years. I'm happy to have freed myself of the, the chair responsibility, but still very much involved with the planning. Um, next year's conference, February 28th through the 2nd, March 2nd, and it's again in Danville at the Hendricks County uh, Fairgrounds. All right, so when it comes to organic, when you hear or, organic food, organic farming, organic agriculture, what comes to mind? Okay, don't, don't think on it too much. And it doesn't have to be good. It doesn't have to, you know, it can be good or bad. High prices. High prices. All right. <laughs> Healthier, no pesticides or chemicals. Okay. Healthy, no pesticides. New challenges with pests, with weeds, yes, okay. Shorter storage life. What's that? Shorter storage life. Shorter storage life, okay. Manure. Manure, uh-huh, yeah, typically. All right. Sustainable. Sustainable agriculture, okay. So I, I always, whenever I'm doing introductory talks, whatever audience it, it is, you get completely different responses, whether it's a group of students, a group of farmers, um, and it just depends on how live, you know, the, the liveliness of the discussion can vary from group to group. Um, so it sounded like several of us are working with organic farmers or those who are transitioning some ground into organic. So how many of us in here is that? Show of hands. So it's... So it's probably more than half of the group. That's good. And who's been to an organic farm? All right, good. And if you haven't, you will this afternoon. So in terms of perceptions of organic, this is often one thing that, that comes to mind for people, OK? Uh, this is just this is a beautiful uh, photo that I captured while at a, it was an organic valley uh, agronomy training over in Holmes County. And I forget the farmer who hosted this. Who is it? Jerry B. Miller. Jerry Miller. Okay. Just a beautiful day. Um, rolling hills out there in Holmes County. This is another thing that people think of with organic farming, right? Weeds. Where's the soybeans in that? Looks like mostly foxtail. And this happens, right? Uh, with, the, with, with a few less tools in the toolbox for managing uh, weeds in our in organic systems, if it's wet, 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 wet after we plant, this can happen, okay? It can be a reality, there's no doubt about it. Uh, and then another thing that people think of, and this is a joke that I can't take credit for, all right? So why is the transition period three years, okay? So to get into organic production and get certified, you have to go three years without applying any prohibited substances. Why, why is it three years? Anybody know? There you go. That's it. There's the joke. It takes three years to grow a ponytail, right? All right, but in reality, organic farming can look almost identical to non-organic farming. This is a picture, actually, uh, of Andy Ambriel and is planting corn in May, late May. Uh, we are putting out some variety plots, and so this is this will be who we visit this afternoon. Okay, so it can look just the same using GPS, VRT, all that modern stuff that we see in in agriculture. It doesn't go away. All right, and this is the stand of corn a few weeks later. Um, you can see some some buckwheat in the row, but actually didn't concern, concern him at all, the corn grow, grew right past it. 
right? And this is also what it can look like, okay? We often think of bare ground, but a lot of farmers are trying to develop new systems to limit tillage, uh, limit those number of passes across the field. So this is a farmer in South Central Wisconsin who transitioned a couple thousand acres over the last five or six years. Uh, and he's no-till planting soybeans into a rye cover crop, a mature rye cover crop. And then you can't really see it in this picture, but immediately following the, the planter is a roller crimper to crimp that rye down. Okay, so we're looking at new systems on how to limit soil disturbance in organic uh, systems with annual crop production. I'd love to go through uh, the uh, talk about more the history of the development of, of the modern organic agriculture movement, uh, but it's something I decided I need to cut out because of time. Uh, Dr. Joel Groover at Western Illinois University has a great talk on the history of organic. Um, and Joel shares pretty much every presentation he's ever given. Um, you can go to slideshare.net. If you haven't been on that website, it's a great resource to find all kinds of presentations. But he has his own page there, J.B. Groover. And if you search through his slides, it's called History of Organic Agriculture. So it starts, you know, over in, in, the, in Europe, uh, you know, in the, the early part of the 1900s, mid part of the 1900s as NPK uh, type of agriculture was coming in. And that's sort of what started uh, this movement to say that maybe that's not the direction we should go with agriculture and sort of turn into the modern, uh, into what we call organic agriculture today uh, and traces it up to J.I. Rodale here in the United States um, and up to present day and passage of the legislation that created uh, the National Organic Program. All right, I wanna take some time to look at a couple of definitions about organic agriculture. This was an early definition that a USDA study team on organic farming put together in 1980. Okay, there was no National Organic Program at that time. There was a patchwork of different uh, protocols, certification programs around the United States where people are getting into organics. So non-governmental entities have their own standards that people were certifying to, uh, but there was no national regulated standard, okay? So the USDA must have sent out a team. They're like, what is this organic thing? This is the definition they came up with. And I like it because it's, it sort of contrasts uh, some of the views that people have on organic. So the first part is often what people think of. It's what's excluded, okay? It's, it's kind of the tools that are taken out of, out of our toolbox in organic. Uh, and it's, you know, so keep in mind, this is prior to when we had the NOP and an actual regulation, okay? So this, this predates that. It says organic farming is a production system which avoids or largely excludes the use of synthetically compounded fertilizers, pesticides, growth regulators, livestock feed additives. Okay, so the key thing there being synthetic. So that's the, the things that are excluded, but I think it's, it's important for us to focus on the best practices that are best practices in any kind of farming, any kind of production system, but that we really have to focus on an organic since a number of these, these uh, uh, other tools are no longer at our disposal, okay? So maximum extent feasible, we rely on crop rotations, crop residues, animal manures, which we heard from Kurt, legume cover crops, green manures, uh, off-farm waste, et cetera, et cetera, uh, in order to maintain productivity, improve the soil, supply plant nutrients, and control pests. And we'll see how that's reflected in the actual standard, okay? This is a long definition, so maybe take a moment to, to read through that. This was, uh, this is a more up-to-date one, and it's from the USDA National Organic Standards Board, uh, a definition that they put forth in April of 1995. So I think a, a big thing to notice in that opening paragraph 
is we see biodiversity, biological cycles, soil biological activity. So organic really focuses on that biological component. Okay. That second one, a key thing is, is it talks about how organic is a labeling term and it's regulated. Okay. It's not a term that we can use loosely when marketing agricultural products. Okay, because it's, it's controlled by the federal government when used in that, in that way. Then we have this long paragraph. It talks about some of the, the sort of the principles that we talked about previously. This word here is a, one that you'll hear a lot is integrity, maintaining organic integrity, making sure that the product is what it's supposed to be, okay, that it was produced according to the organic standards. And then the last one I think is again, kind of one of these philosophical definitions around organic that are hard to quantify. Okay, and, that, and that's true in the standard. It's not very quantitative because a lot of these things are difficult to quantify that we're, we're trying to achieve with organic. So primary goal of organic agriculture is to optimize the health and productivity of interdependent communities of soil, life, plants, animals, and people. Okay, so it's this idea of holism if you go through that uh, slide set from Joel Groover on history of organic agriculture, you'll see this discussion around holism come up quite a bit and how we look at things in terms of systems. All right, so quickly about uh, uh, the legislation and the formation of the National Organic Program. So I mentioned how there was this patchwork of different um, certification standards around the United States that people were certifying to, but it wasn't standardized across the nation. So as the organic movement was growing, it got to a point where um, in order for that to continue to grow and markets to expand, we couldn't have this patchwork of standards that differed uh, from region to region. Okay? If you had to get certified to all these different standards, I mean, that's a huge barrier to expanding the marketplace. So essentially the organic community, members of the organic community went to uh, their elected officials, legislators and said, we want a national standard. I don't know what that looked like and who the key figures were in that process, but it's interesting that a part, that a, an agricultural community, a sector of agriculture went to the federal government and said, regulate us, right? It's a, it's a voluntary regulation, it's a voluntary standard, um, but that's, I think that's an interesting thing about organic. Uh, so that would have been, I guess, in the late 80s. And then we had the passage of the Organic Food Production Act in 1990. Okay, so that was the bill that mandated uh, USDA to create the National Organic Program. Okay, it defined what the standard would look like and how it would be managed. Okay, so from the, the passage in 1990, the rulemaking process to actually get the final NOP rule implemented and in place and people certifying to it took 12 years. It wasn't until 2002 that we actually had uh, a national organic program uh, in place. And I think that surprises a lot of people that it's that young, okay? So it took 12 years of kind of back and forth between the organic community and USDA to come to agreement on what this national standard would look like, okay? And a piece of it is the National Organic Standards Board that is a 15, I think it's 15 member board of uh, volunteers uh, in the organic community representing farmers, consumer advocates, environmentalists, scientists, and others. The seats are defined, uh, there's processors, I forget, but basically they, they will take issues up from the organic community and discuss them and vote on recommendations that would go to the USDA NOP uh, about changes to the standard, changes in what materials are approved or not approved uh, and different things like that. Okay, so it's actually a community board that advises how this standard evolves over time. Okay, so it's another really unique aspect, I think, of of the National Organic Program standard. 
And I think that's all I'll hit on that. So another thing to clarify, NOP is two things. It's the standard, it's the regulation that defines what organic production is and how you get certified and how certifiers work and all those things. But it's also the program under USDA AMS, Agricultural Marketing Service, that administers the program, okay? That accredits certifying bodies, that deals with enforcement um, and hands out citations and fines for people who are cheating and things like that. Okay, so it's the standard and it's this body within USDA. All right, so I think I touched on this. It's a regulated term. If we're gonna use the word organic or that label, the USDA organic label, we've gotta be certified. We can't just throw that word around. So you've probably seen people at the farmer's market who say, you know, th these are organic vegetables, but are they certified? If they're not certified, they shouldn't be using that term to market their products unless they fall under an exemption. And that exemption is, is pretty low. It's just 5,000 in gross sales per year. So it's pretty darn easy to get to 5,000 in sales. You know, you grow a small high tunnel of tomatoes and you're gonna exceed $5,000 in sales in a year. But if you fall under that, you can market stuff as organic, but otherwise to use that word, to use the label, you've gotta be certified, okay? So I think that's something that's really important for us to communicate to people who are interested in organic. So anybody can obviously use organic practices, you know, with how they, how they farm, how they garden, but in order to market those products, you gotta go through the certification process or fall under that exemption. Okay, so I think it's important for farmers who are getting into this or businesses, handlers, processors getting into this, they've got to study the relevant parts of the regulation that apply to them. All right, so how many have, of you have spent time on looking through federal code? Good. Well, all of you are going to be forced to look at some later today. Okay, I printed a portion of... 7 CFR 205, that's the section in the federal code uh, that is the National Organic Program, and we'll, we'll look at some pieces of that. All right, really the only parts of federal code that I've ever looked at is this, and I've read the whole thing, and then the Produce Safety Rule, part of FISMA, uh, the Food Safety Modernization Act. I don't think I've read any other code. Okay, what's, oops, hit the wrong button. All right, so the USDA standard is not the only one on the planet. Uh, there are standards uh, in other nations, um, and these are what some of those labels look like. The one in the upper right, this is the EU standard. Uh, we can see Australia, Canada, Japan, and I'm not sure what some of these other ones are, but for people who are looking at export markets, they may need to get certified to one of these standards as well, unless there's some kind of a, um, an agreement between USDA, equivalency, that's the term, an equivalency agreement between USDA and some of these other countries, okay? And he can probably touch on some of that if you have, have questions on some of the fine details because there's some very interesting um, nuances where, for, for instance, between the U.S. and Canada, uh, Canada won't take organic crops that are produced using um, Chilean nitrate, right? Which you can use under the USDA, under the U.S. standard. So anyway, there's little things like that. Uh, under, under the NOP, uh, I talked about the certification process. You have to work with a certifier. So that becomes a part of how you operate as a farming business or a food business, whatever, whatever you're in. You have to work with a certifier to get certified. Okay, and there's, uh, within Indiana, when I l last looked at this organic integrity database, uh, which you can look up, just search it, uh, there were about 17 accredited certifying agents uh, working with clients in Indiana, okay? But there's only one that's physically based in Indiana. OK, 
Okay, you don't have to work with an entity that's, you know, a certifier that's based in Indiana. The one that is physically based here in Indiana is EcoCert, who Brad works with, and we'll hear from him next. So yeah, uh, farms, operations can choose what certifier they want to work with. They all have kind of different fee schedules that they operate under, whether it's a, based on gross sales, it might be based on acreage, um, and different things like that. Okay, so ba and, and they offer kind of different services. So some certifiers just offer certification services. Others might have certification services, but then under a separate entity under kind of an umbrella organization. They'll also offer educational services, or maybe they're a farmer member organization, you know, that does an annual conference. Uh, some of them do policy, like advocacy type work. Um, so each of these organizations kind of look different, but there's, it's very clear in the NOP regulation that a certifier, there has to be kind of a firewall between that certifier and if they have a kind of a sister organization that does educational stuff because certifiers can't also act as consultants or educators, okay? Anyway, moving on. So I touched on this uh, about certifying in order to use the word organic to market agricultural products. A lot of small uh, farm operations that are focused on direct sales at farmers markets, maybe direct to restaurants, CSA, things like that, choose not to certify. They're using organic practices, but based on the markets, that market doesn't care if they actually have that USDA certificate, okay? That would include my small part-time farm. We don't mess with, with it because it's just farmer's market and a little bit of on-farm sales. So we choose not to certify, uh, so we don't have that added cost, and uh, I don't have time to keep records because I can barely keep up with my farm as it is. Uh, but I think this is an important thing. When you have people interested in getting into farming, starting a farm, maybe diversifying their farm, and they're thinking about organic, have them think about the markets, where they're gonna end up. Does that market need that USDA label? Does it need that word organic? Or can, can you communicate your practices in a different way? Okay, the, the great thing about getting certified is you can communicate your practices with that label pretty clearly, okay? So that's something to, to, to consider as people are asking you questions. All right, let's move on to some stats about the marketplace. This is taken from the Organic Trade Association, their 2017 report, showing growth in organic sales, both food and non-food. So non-food would be things like apparel, right? Made with organic textiles, uh, cotton, right? Cosmetics, that's a very rapidly growing uh, sector of organics. But you can see the growth uh, from 1997, sales were about 3.6 billion to uh, the figures you see there for, for 2015. So it's a growth market and it has been for quite a long time. That's why grocery stores and big food processors are scrambling to adjust um, and get into this marketplace because it's, it's the growth area. Here's from the uh, 2018 Organic Trade Association report. You can see that in 2017, organic sales are just about at 50 billion. A lot of words here. I just wanna focus on, again, the growth that we've seen. So uh, in 1990, when OFPA, the Organic Food Production Act, was passed, organic sales uh, were at a billion. Then by the time it actually went into place in 2002, it was up to 8.6, and then now up to today, almost 50 billion. So just tremendous growth. All right, this sort of breaks out. This is taken from USDA. Um, this kind of breaks out by segment of how organic sales stack up. And you can see that fruit and veg has been on top for a while. And I think a lot of times when people are deciding how to spend their, their food dollar in the grocery store, they'll often choose fruit and vegetables first because of uh, uh, the idea that they're getting less pesticide exposure by choosing organic fresh uh, fruits and vegetables, right? And there's research that shows that for sure. 
uh, on the fruit and veg side. Another uh, growing segment would be dairy, and we'll hear a little bit about that uh, this afternoon. And you can see how some of the other things stack up. Snack foods, I saw organic Doritos. Whether you think that that fits with the spirit of organic or not, it's a reality, okay? It's, it is what it is, I guess. All right, if we look globally, uh, US is number one when it comes to the organic market, okay? It's the biggest organic marketplace in the world, by far, in terms of total sales, uh, followed by you know, Western Europe uh, is a lot in that top 10 or however many are there. Uh, but when you look at per capita consumption, uh, U.S. is still up there, but um, parts of Europe have much higher per capita consumption. If we look at distribution of organic operations in the United States, this is a map uh, from 2015. And you can see clusters here and there. California has been on top for a long time, and that's driven by their specialty crop production in the valleys. Okay, a lot of those huge fruit and vegetable operations out there have diversified. Okay, they've got non-organic production as their, the dominant part, but they've diversified into organic production because that's where a lot of the market's moving and they respond. Uh, and then up into Oregon and Washington, you know, a lot of the apple production uh, and other tree fruit production up there because they have the, the dry climate during that growing season that makes it much easier to manage pests in tree fruit. And, and berry, a lot of blue, organic blueberry production in Oregon. And, um, another cluster, upper Midwest, a lot of field crop and dairy production. And then the Northeast. A lot of dairy and poultry, a lot of poultry out there on the East Coast. One of the biggest users of organic grains is Purdue chicken um, because they've really expanded their organic production quite a lot. All right, so we hear about all this growth, uh, but how much land of all the agricultural land in the United States, how much of it do you think is actually certified organic? Guesses? 1%. What is it? 1%. Yep, you're close. It's actually just, it's still just under 1%. I think the last stat I saw is like 0.9%. Okay, this is a chart from Organic Trade Association showing that, uh, showing the percent, the growth in the percentage of organic food versus total food sales. So total food sales have exceeded 5% in the U.S., but the, when we look at the actual farmland, it's still under 1%. And I think that's explained by a couple things. One, a lot of the value uh, is with specialty crops on smaller acreage, but also we're making up for a lot of the demand um, with imports. Okay, so we're importing quite a bit of organic uh, commodities and foods. Missed opportunity, right? All right, so uh, a nice transparency aspect of um, of organic production and NOP is that we have this nice database. So any, any operations that's, that's certified, that has a certificate, we can look them up on this integrity database. So you can sort by state, uh, sort by certifier, sort by products that are listed, uh, and you can get contact info. For, so for me, an extension person, I can find a lot of my clients just by opening up this database, okay? So, the last time I pulled the Indiana data from the Integrity Database back in May, we had 770 certified organic operations in Indiana. And if you look at the scopes of certification, by scope I mean either crop, livestock, uh, handling, which is any kind of processing, uh, could be an L, you know, a, a feed mill, uh, a chip manufacturer, whatever. Um, and then a, another scope is wild crops, if you're foraging for mushrooms or ginseng or, or something like that. But we had 573 of those operations had crops within their certificate, 405 had livestock, 117 handling. And you can have any combination of those. So you could have a farm that's doing crops and livestock and some processing. 
Okay. Now, if you look at this map, I took the mailing addresses associated with those certificates and threw them into a Google map so I can visualize where are these at. If you can see those dots, what's the trend? Amish areas. That's right. All right. So our northern counties, LaGrange, Elkhart, and some of the surrounding, that's the biggest cluster. I think over half of the certified organic operations are in LaGrange County alone. Um, that's probably where my office should be. But. <laughs> then we've got uh, a cluster here in Park County, some dairy. You, you cover that, uh, Ross, right? Yep. And then uh, there's a growing number of vegetable producers there. They formed a co-op a couple years ago and starting to get some traction with some markets there. Another cluster in Wayne County, dairy, some produce. And then, then it's kind of scattered from there. All right. If we look at sales uh, in Indiana, this is taken from, in your folder, uh, the first printout there on the left-hand left -hand side. That was put together by Ariana Torres just based on the last USDA organic survey conducted in 2016. She pulled the Indiana information and distilled it into some nice tables and charts. But this shows the breakdown kind of from a high level and you can see that most of the sales are from livestock and poultry products. So dairy and eggs. Okay, and then livestock and poultry, so chickens. That'd be a big part of it. And any cold dairy cows for ground beef, maybe. Um, and then crops are a very small segment. So we do not have much organic uh, fruit and vegetable production going on here in Indiana. It's it's small. So we might have a lot of producers, small producers who are using organic practices, but very few are actually getting certified. They okay, finding it challenging to get into those wholesale markets um, that maybe Michigan and Wisconsin growers have been in for, for longer and have, have dominated for a while. Uh, if we look at some of the other stats from that, uh, we can see uh, with North Central states or Midwest states, Indiana's kind of at the bottom for most of these and we need to change that okay uh, Wisconsin a leader in, in total organic acres by a lot uh, cropland acres Indiana at the bottom but I think that's changing quickly we have a lot of farmers with with ground in transition so we'll see how the stats change here in the, the coming years uh, and then I think because we have a lot of dairies we're kind of middle tier when it comes to pasture all right, so what's driving this? It's mom, right? It's millennial moms that are doing this. So the sort of the torch has, has been passed in terms of who commands the most uh, weight in the food marketplace from baby boomers to the millennial generation. Okay, millennials, I guess, now have more spending power in the, in the consumer marketplace. And that's what's a big part of what's driving this. Okay, they're making different choices and how they spend their food dollars. Uh, this is just kind of a side note. Um, I don't have data or anything on this. It's more anecdotal. But I think from a landowner perspective, that could become a driver for farmers moving forward. So as land gets passed to the next generation, um, you may see those landowners making different decisions about how they want their land managed. So that might be longtime tenant. You've been farming this land for you know a long time. Uh, can you transition this to organic? And if that farmer's not up to it, they might look for someone else who will. Okay. Um, I don't think that's huge yet, but I, I hear of it in places. Uh, Central Illinois, where a lot of landowners might be up in Chicago, they've got good jobs. They're not dependent on the income from that that rented ground, that leased ground. They're interested in organic, they're buying organic food themselves, and they're looking for farmers to transition their, their land. So I think that this is something that could, we could see a little bit more of moving forward. Uh, so we're seeing big names in the industry scrambling, as I mentioned, to, to secure supply, get stuff on the shelves that's, that's certified organic. General Mills has bought, bought up a lot of companies. That's typically the route for the big 
big uh, consumer food brands uh, to get into organic is they buy companies that were started in the 80s and 90s by people with ponytails, right? We, we talked about that earlier. And, and that's how they're getting in. So there's, there's been a lot of consolidation playing out in the organic marketplace because of entities like General Mills and Purdue Chicken. If you're interested in what that looks like, this guy, Phil Powered at Michigan State, has a fascinating chart where he looks at the consolidation in the industry. Um, so I won't dwell on that. I want to kind of shift to one of the biggest opportunities and why you would have noticed earlier, a lot of my extension program is, is focused on grains, on field crops. And that's because that's where there's a huge opportunity. We grow corn and soybeans in Indiana, and there's a lot of demand in the organic marketplace for organic corn and soybean and other grains. So why not take advantage of that opportunity? Okay. So we can see that acreage has been growing in corn, organic corn, soybean, and wheat uh, in the United States over the last decade or so. But it's, it's, not, it's not fast enough, okay? So these next two slides are taken from a consultant, Peter Golbitz with Agromaris, his consulting firm. And he shared these slides at, a, at the Organic and Non-GMO Forum in St. Louis in 2017. And he, he basically tried to uh, distilled some of the statistics around the growth in demand and supply uh, in organic corn and soybeans. Okay, so right here in, in this box, 2016 imported organic corn made up 46% of U.S. supply for soybeans imports were 75% of supply. Okay, and if he forecast he, he forecasted these numbers out you know, based on some growth trends. It says here, U.S. acres have been increasing at an average of 12.7% per year the past three years, while need has increased 34.6%. Okay, so demand just continues to outpace supply, even though more supply is coming online. And he said, if we, look, if we forecast that out based on those rates, and maybe, maybe the supply could potentially increase really rapidly, because we heard several of you saying farmers are you know, conventional grain farmers are looking to transition acreage. We could have just a glut of acres suddenly come online in a short period of time. Who knows? But based on these figures, he says that the current rate of growth of acres of soy and corn, it will take until 2025 for U.S. producers to provide what the market needed in 2016. Okay, so it's just a, it's a big mismatch. And we're importing a lot of this stuff. And if any of you have been paying attention to headlines, there have been some issues, right, with some fraudulent activity here and there. And so I think the best remedy to that, since that poses a threat to the integrity of organic, is we need to increase domestic supply to, or domestic production, okay? I think that's the best way to address this problem. Uh, and I wanna help Indiana farmers take advantage of that. If you're interested in prices, AMS maintains this page with organic reports. Uh, some of them are updated um, weekly or bi-weekly, uh, but we've got milk, eggs, chicken, produce, uh, cotton, not relevant for us, grain, and then retail store uh, prices for different products. If we look at the uh, grain report, and again, this is nationwide, it's not just Midwest, prices vary quite a lot by region. I know a lot of Indiana farmers who are shipping uh, train loads of grain to Pennsylvania and the East Coast because they're getting a premium that they can absorb uh, the transportation costs because they're paying a lot in the Northeast for organic grain. But anyway, you can see some of the prices. This is the last report. I think the most recent one probably came out today. But you can see the prices for feed grade corn, feed grade soybean, wheat, and the trend, this green one is for 2018, so it's been pretty stable around that $10 range for corn and around $18 for soybean nationally. This, I just wanted to point out, in that report they include um, the estimate on import volumes for corn, soybean, and durum wheat. And you can see the year-to-date volumes. Now, if we look, compare that to conventional grain volumes that we talk about and think about, it looks pretty small, but this is, this is still huge. We're still on pace uh, for the same amount of imports 
uh, in 2018 as we saw in 16 and 17. Okay, so that trend isn't, hasn't changed. Wolf Co-op, which we'll hear about later, uh, they share prices on their website. Uh, this is what I pulled yesterday, so new crop corn at 990, soybeans 1850. And barley, that's a nice price for organic barley. Uh, another uh, a firm that's uh, a recent startup based in New York called Mercaris. They're trying to provide better market information on organic and non-GMO grains. This is what their most recent market report. Um, and their numbers often look a, a little different than USDA's numbers. They're surveying a, a slightly different uh, sample uh, of, of buyers and other people in the industry, but you can see they have it broken out by region. If we look at Corn Belt for feed grade corn, uh, they're saying 1030, which is up big time from this time last year. Soybeans. In that 18 to 19 dollar range wheat nine to ten dollar range so their price looks a little better on wheat I got a wasp here <clears throat> if you've got farmers who are interested Mercaris does offer a free plan for farmers that they can get basic uh, price information okay they won't get all the all the data services and whatnot that Mercaris provides but they can sign up at this mercaris.com slash farmers all right, so there's this, this shortfall, there's this growth in organics. Why aren't we seeing more farmers jump at it? This is a picture of a longtime organic farmer, Jack Arisman in North Central Illinois. Great guy. Uh, he's quoted here saying it takes a high level of skill and will to be a successful organic farmer. So we see a lot of people responding to it because we have low conventional commodity prices. They see some potential to make margins in the organic marketplace. But when they hit those hard years, is that going to be enough to get them through? I think that's that will part, right? They got to shift their management and they've got to be in it, I think, for more than just the price. For the long run, I think that that's important. And I hear that from a lot of longtime organic farmers. Commodity prices will go back up. We know that. And so will we separate the wheat from the shaft the next time that happens, right? We're seeing a lot of people jump in, but I think that will part, other motivating factors is what it's going to take for people to stay in organics, okay? So some of the barriers, this is based on different studies and my own sort of anecdotal talking with farmers, some of the things that we hear of why they don't get into organic or are, uh, you know, maybe nervous about it, okay? So access to information, that's a big one and what I'm trying to address and I think those of us here today can help with. Potential for low yields, and not just in transition, but those first few years in actual certified organic production. As, that, as you shift your management, learning a new system of production, and that soil ecosystem is changing. We're getting to more biologically mediated um, uh, fertility management, right? And so the soil has to change. Uh, maybe some initial cost, right? Retooling of equipment. But we, we can redirect some of those annual expenses like herbicide uh, and pesticides and redirect those into um, equipment, right? Market uncertainty, do we have a lender that supports us, right? Can we present a business plan that, that, somebody's gonna, that a lender is gonna get behind? Right, I talked to Andy who's hosting us this afternoon and he said that some lenders still won't won't support him even though he can put together a beautiful five-year plan to transition a field and have it in organic production for a few years that just from a from a five-year plan proposal looks phenomenally better than any commissional grain you know one year in you know from year to year it's just night and day but he can he still has trouble with some lenders uh, risk management options that's improving uh, and I think a key thing that I talked about earlier, support network. Who can you turn to with questions? Do you have farmers in your neighborhood, in your county who are organic farmers, right? Who can you pick up the phone and talk through things with? And then everything between the ears, right? I think that's a big part of it. 
All right, I'm running short on time, so I think I'm going to skip some things here because we got to keep moving forward. Uh, Canada Organic Growers, I know we're not in Canada, but there's some similarities. They just published this report where they did case studies or, uh, and, and focus groups and in-depth interviews with organic farmers across Canada to understand uh, their experiences with transition. And some of the top things that came out was understanding the process of certification. We're going to talk about that next. Getting into record keeping. Okay, you have to maintain records uh, so that you can prove to the certifier and the inspector that what you're doing on your farm is actually what you say you're doing, okay, in your organic system plan. You have to maintain records of uh, your purchases, of, of inputs and seed, uh, activities in the field, uh, crops harvested, production of cow, you know, milk production from your cows, sale receipts, all those things. Basically, so you can audit everything coming in and everything going out and everything in between. Okay, so you, gotta have, you have to develop a good record keeping system. Um, weed management, we already heard about that. That's a challenge. What's allowed or not in terms of inputs? Because if you go and purchase something that's not approved and apply it before you run it by your certifier, oops, that land is going to be taken out of organic and has to be transitioned back in. Okay, so understanding what's allowed. And then buyers, market. Okay, some areas you may not have easy access to buyers. Uh, another great report, and I'm going to skip through this pretty quick, is conducted in partnership between Oregon State University and Oregon TILF, which is a certifier, certifying body. They also do educational services and things. They, they interviewed a huge sample of organic and transitioning to organic farmers across the U.S., like 1,800 farmers, I think. Um, they access that through NRCS and those who participated in um, some of the programs that they offer to support organic and transitioning farmers. But I, I wanna get, just show similar trends here, uh, major obstacles, weed management, we see it again, cost of organic certification, we've got some things to help offset those costs. And then you can see some of the other minor things. Again, record keeping comes up. Uh, cost and access to organic inputs, soil fertility, uh, some market stuff, and so on. But then I think this is, an, this is an interesting one for those of us in extension, at least, and maybe uh, the districts with educational programming, is what, what do these people think are the best ways to get support and information? Number one, mentoring from experienced organic farmers. That's why I said I want my extension program to be farmer-driven, farmer-focused. They want to hear from other farmers. So at that field day I had last month, it wasn't me up there telling them how to get into organic and how to use equipment to, to raise organic crops. It was other farmers talking about their experience. I think that's, that's how they want to learn. Um, but how can, we, how can we help develop those mentoring relationships? How can we help people connect? One-on-one uh, -on -one technical assistance during transition, we hear that a lot, you know, basically hand-holding. Uh, and there aren't a lot of us with that in-depth knowledge, and they can't get that hand-holding from the certifier. Certifier can say yes, no, right? But that's about it <laughs> when it comes to, you know, telling them what do I actually do with my operation to make it comply. In-person workshops, short courses, that's something we can do well. Books and other printed materials, online courses and webinars come at the bottom, okay? All right, and I'll, I guess I'll, maybe I'll leave it with this. These are quotes from a book from Canada Organic Growers about transition. And I like, I talked about this. The most important aspect is the transition of the mind. If you're not with it mentally, it's not going to work. The main barrier is believing that it would work. The biggest change is between your ears. And then this one, this, this is a fun one. This is a nice quote from a guy from Saskatchewan. So it's his wife who pestered him. She was very encouraging and supportive. I listened to her and should have listened to her sooner. It's a problem. Too few men listen to their wives about food quality. The women know more about these things. <laughs> All right, so quickly on transition. It's three years. 
Brad will talk a little bit more about that. Three years from the date of the last application of a prohibited substance, a substance that's not permitted in organic production. Okay? We can adjust our rotations if we're thinking about an annual crop rotation, corn, soybean, weed, etc. We can time it such that that date of last application allows us to have the third year crop certifiable. So we only have to market two crops conventionally during transition. It's the best way to manage it so you're not stuck marketing a third crop uh, in the conventional marketplace when you're under organic management in transition. Okay. And then we don't have to go whole hog. We don't have to take the whole farm. I talked about that. An operation can be split or parallel, meaning they have non-organic and organic production uh, within the same operation. It's just different parcels of land, right? Uh, and we can take a phased approach. So we can take a field here, start it in year one, year two, start another field, and so on. So we're not taking it all at once. Okay, we can spread that risk. Depends on the farm. Depends on the situation, okay? So next up, we're gonna hear about that certification process, some more details about what's certifiable, what's not, uh, and other details. So, questions? Here. Let's, uh, for the re recording, so you guys, I think you obviously saw the camera. We're getting this recorded so we can share this with other people. Okay, you're gonna use that one. So we wanna capture uh, the questions as best we can. Okay. You're not. Doesn't make me anything. any louder. <laughs> uh, I had this question recently, actually, from a, a conventional crop farmer who farms pretty large acreage. Was thinking of, you know, moving over some of his acreage, but he's they've moved away recently from uh, making their own chemical applications to going more with the co-op. And his question was, is there anybody out there who is applying or has who can apply organic fertilizers Inputs. as a commercial applicator or if anybody's. not in Boone County yeah yeah so so you, you can find some of that in areas where there's more of a, a developed cluster of organic production uh, Wisconsin there are uh, firms that provide those services Midwest Bioag is a good example they've recently um, open satellite branches in Illinois and one in Ohio and they've got spreaders to spread bulk bulk you know fertility uh, materials and things like that but yeah it's it's pretty thin um, are there some outfits up in your area yeah I'd say if you're working with a smaller co-op like if they do the right steps if they're willing to work with you you know the but it'd be, you know, would you have enough equipment to be able to just devote some equipment or do you have to do the full clean out and all that kind okay, of Okay, so, yeah, so yeah, when it comes to your own equipment. But no, I'm talking about the commercial guys. Cause, you know, okay, like, whether it's the commercial guys yeah. or, you know, you're hiring some custom work or it's your own operation. If you're going from applying, you know, conventional inputs that are prohibited and organic, uh, whether that's you know, a planter that has treated seed and GMO seed to a combine, to a sprayer, whatever it is. If you're going from something, you know, equipment that has contacted prohibited substances or has, uh, you know, seeds or grain that's genetically modified, whatever, you've got to do cleanouts and you have to document that cleanout. So if you're hiring custom work, they've got to document that cleanout. It's got to be part of your. Yes. So, yep. Uh, there was an example, and this is not related to equipment clean out, but there was an example uh, that, that I tried to provide some information on from an insurance standpoint of an organic field in Randolph County that the co-op pulled into the wrong field <coughs> and sprayed the organic soybeans with Roundup. <laughs> it's not a bill I would want to pay when soybeans are $19, $20. Huh? They probably looked like they. They, pr they probably look like they needed them, but yeah. So yes, equipment clean out, record keeping, huge deal. So that's why you sign up for the drip watch, right? That drip, isn't that? So yeah, the example of the uh, f the 
field that got sprayed by the co-op, um, drift watch, field watch would be a good tool to use. It's not fireproof because if an entity isn't using it, you know, it doesn't do anything. But is everybody familiar with field watch? Anybody not familiar? Okay. So field watch, it's, a, it's an online, it's a website. Um, it's, it was started by Purdue and the Office of the Indiana State Chemist, but it's now its own nonprofit, and it's in several provinces in Canada and several states. But you can register fields. You basically trace them out on a Google map interface, and you put your information, what's growing there. Is it organic? Is it transitional? Is it specialty crop? Whatever. Any kind of sensitive crop, sensitive lands, you can register them, provide your contact information so pesticide applicators can get on there and look around the fields where they're going to be making applications to see if there's something they need to be concerned about. And what's that called again? Field watch. And the new dicamba products, it's actually required on the label that if you're going to be applying those new dicamba products, um, you have to check field watch. It's required. So yeah, I, I don't see all organic farmers using it for some reason. Um, but it is a way that I've found some transitioning to organic people. They had their fields listed because you can mark transitioning. 